Robinson Crusoe, Chapter Seven, Agricultural Experience. I had now been in this unhappy island above ten months. All possibility of deliverance from this condition seems to be entirely taken from me, and I firmly believe that no human shape had ever set foot upon that place. Having now secured my habitation, as I thought, fully to my mind, I had a great desire to make a more perfect discovery of the island and to see what other productions I might find, which I yet knew nothing of. It was on the 15th of July that I began to take a more particular survey of the island itself. I went up the creek first, where as I hinted, I brought my rafts on shore. I found after I came about two miles up that the tide did not flow any higher and that it was no more than a little brook of running water, very fresh and good. But this being the dry season, there was hardly any water in some parts of it, at least not enough to run in any stream, so as it could be perceived. On the banks of this brook, I found many pleasant savannals or meadows, plain, smooth, and covered with grass. And on the rising parts of them, next to the higher grounds, where the water, as might be supposed, never overflowed. I found a great deal of tobacco, green, and growing to a great and very strong stalk. They were diverse other plants, which I had no notion of or understanding about that might perhaps have virtues of their own which i could not find out i searched for the cassava root which the indians in all that climate make their bread of but i could find none i saw large plants of aloe and did not understand them I saw several sugar canes and wild and for want of cultivation imperfect. I contented myself with these discoveries for this time and came back, musing with myself what course I might take to know the virtue and goodness of any of the fruits or plants which I should discover, but could bring it to no conclusion. For, in short, I had made so little observation where I was in the Brazils that I knew little of the plants in the field, at least very little that might serve to any purpose now in my distress. The next day, the 16th, I went up the same way again, and after going something further than I had gone the day before, I found the brook in the savannas seas and the country become more woody than before. In this part, I found different fruits, and particularly, I found melons upon the ground, in great abundance, and grapes upon the trees. The vines had spread, indeed, over the trees, and the clusters of grapes were just now on their prime, very ripe and rich. This was a surprising discovery and I was exceeding glad of them, but I was warned by my experience to eat sprinkly of them, remembering that when I was ashore in Barbary, the eating of grapes killed several of our Englishmen, who were slaves there, by throwing them into fluxes and fevers. But I found an excellent use for these grapes, and that was to cure or dry them in the sun and keep them as dried grapes or raisins but i found an excellent use for these grapes and that was to cure or dry them in the sun and keep them as dried grapes or raisins i kept which i thought would be as indeed they were wholesome and agreeable to eat when no grapes could be had i spent all that evening there and went not back to my habitation, which, by the way, was the first night, as I might say. I had lain from home. In the night, I took my first contrivance, and got up in a tree, where I slept well. In the next morning proceeded upon my discovery, traveling nearly four miles, as I might judge by the length of the valley, 
keeping still drew north with a ridge of hills on the south and north side of me at the end of this march i came to an opening where the country seemed to descend to the west and a little spring of fresh water which used out of the side of the hill by me ran the other way that is due east and the country appeared so fresh so green so flourishing everything being in a constant verdure or flourish of spring that it looked like a planted garden i descended a little on the side of that delicious vale surveying it with a secret kind of pleasure though mixed with my other affliction thoughts to think that this was all my own that i was king and lord of all this country undefensibly and had a right of possession and if i could convey it i might have it in inheritance as completely as any lord of a manor in england i saw here abundance of cocoa trees orange and lemon and citron trees but all wild and very few bearing any fruit at least not then however the green limbs that i gathered were not only pleasant to eat but very wholesome and mixed their truce afterwards with water which made it very wholesome and very cool and refreshing i found now i had business enough to gather and carry home and i resolved to lay up a store as well of grapes as limbs and lemons to furnish myself for the wet season which i knew was approaching in order to do this i gathered a great heap of grapes in one place a ledger heap in another place and a great parcel of limbs and lemons in another place and taking a few of each with me i travelled homewards resolving to come again and bring a bag or a sack or what i could make to carry the rest home accordingly having spent three days in this journey i came home so i must now call my tent and my cave but before i got thither the grapes were spoiled the richness of the fruit and the weight of the juice having broken them and bruised them they were good for little or nothing as to the limbs they were good but i could bring but a few the next day being the nineteenth i went back having made me two small bags to bring home my harvest but i was surprised when coming to my heap of grapes which were so rich and fine when i gathered them to find them all spread about trod to pieces and dragged about some here some there and abundance eaten and devoured by this i concluded there were some wild creatures thereabouts which had done this but what they were i knew not however as i found there was no laying them up on heaps and no carrying them away in a sack but that one way they would be destroyed and the other way they would be crushed with their own weight and took another course for i gathered a large quantity of the grapes and hanged them tree that they might cure or dry in the sun and as for the limbs and lemons i carried as many back as i could well stand under when i came home from this journey i contemplated with great pleasure the fruitfulness of the valley and the pleasantness of the situation the security from storms on that side of the water and the wood and concluded that i had pitched upon a place to fix my abode which was by far the worst part of the country which the whole i began to consider of removing my habitation and looking out for a place equally safe as where as i was situate if possible in that pleasant fruitful part of the island this thought was long in my head and i was exceeding fond of it for some time the pleasantness of the place tempted me but when i came to a nearer view of it i considered that i was now by the seaside where it was at least possible that something might happen to my advantage and by the same ill fate that brought me hither might bring some other unhappy wretches to the same place and thought it was scarce probable 
that any such thing should ever happen. Yet, to enclose myself among the hills and woods in the center of the island was to anticipate my bandage, and to render such an affair not only improbable, but impossible, and that therefore I ought not by any means to remove. However, I was so enamored of the place, that I spent much of my time there for the whole of the remaining part of the month of July, and thought upon second thoughts. I resolved not to remove, yet I built me a little kind of a bower, and surrounded it at a distance with a strong fence, being a double hedge as high as I could reach, well stacked and filled between with brushwood, and here I lay very secure, sometimes two or three nights together, always going over it with a ladder, so that I fancied now I had my country house and my sea coast house, and this work took me up to the beginning of August. I had but newly finished my fence and begun to enjoy my labor. When the trains came on, and made me stick close to my first habitation, for thought I made me a tent like the other, with a piece of a sail, and spread it very well. Yet I had not the shelter of a hill to keep me from storms, not a cave behind me to retreat into when the rains were extraordinary. About the beginning of August, as I said, I had finished my bower, and begun to enjoy myself. The 3rd of August, I found the grapes I had hid up perfectly dried, and indeed were excellent good resins of the sun. So I began to take them down from the trees, and it was very happy that I did so, for the rains which followed would have spoiled them, and I had lost the best part of my winter food, for I had above two hundred large bunches of them. No sooner had I taken them all down and carried the most of them home to my cave, then it began to rain, and from hence, which was the 14th of August, it rained, more or less, every day till the middle of October, and sometimes so violently that I could not steer out of my cave for several days. In this season, I was much surprised with the increase of my family. I had been concerned for the loss of one of my cats, who ran away from me, or, as I thought, had been dead, and I heard no more tidings of her till. To my astonishment, she came home about the end of August with three kittens. This was the more strange to me, because, though I had killed a wild cat, as I call it, as I called it, with my gun, yet I thought it was quite a different kind from our European cats. But the young cats were the same kind of house breed as the old one. And both my cats being females, I thought it was strange. I thought it was very strange. But from these three cats, I afterwards came to be so pestered with cats that I was forced to kill them like vermin or wild beasts and to drive them from my house as much as possible. From the 14th of August to the 26th, incessant rain, so that I could not steer, and was now very careful not to be much wet. In this confinement, I began to be straightened for food. By venturing out twice, I one day killed a goat, and the last day, which was the 26th, found a very large tortoise, which was a treat to me, and my food was regulated Thus, I ate a bunch of raisins for my breakfast, a piece of goat flesh, or of the turtle for my dinner, broiled, for, to my great misfortune, I had no vessel to boil or stew anything, and two or three of the turtle's eggs for my supper. During this confinement, in my cover by the rain, I worked daily two or three hours at enlarging my cave, and by degrees, worked it on towards one side, till I came to the outside of the hill, and made a door or way out, which came beyond my fence or wall. And so I came in and out, this way. But I was not perfectly easy at laying so open, for as I had managed myself before, I was in a perfect enclosure, whereas 
Now I thought I lay exposed and open for anything to come in upon me, and yet I could not perceive that there was any living thing to fear. The biggest creature that I had yet seen upon the island being a goat. September 13. I was now come to the unhappy anniversary of my landing. I cast up the notches of my post and found I had been on shore 365 days. I kept this day as a solemn fast, setting it apart for religious exercise, prostrating myself for the ground with the most serious humiliation, confessing my sins to God, acknowledging his righteous judgments upon me, and praying to him to have mercy on me through Jesus Christ, and not having tasted the least refreshment for twelve hours. Even till the going down of the sun, I then ate a biscuit cake and a bunch of grapes, and went to bed. Finishing the day as I began it, I had all this time observed no Sabbath day, for as at first I had no sense of religion upon my mind. I had, after some time, omitted to distinguish the weeks by making a longer notch than ordinary for the Sabbath day, and so did not really know what any of the days were. But now, having cast up the days as above, I found I had been there a year. So I divided it into weeks and set apart every seventh day for a Sabbath. Though so I found at the end of my account I had lost a day or two in my renocking. A little after this, my ink began to fail me, so I contented myself to use it more springly and to write down only the most remarkable events of my life without continuing a daily memorandum of other things. The rainy season and the dry season began now to appear regular to me, and I learned to define them so as to provide for them accordingly. But I brought all my experience before I had it, and this I am going to relate was one of the most discouraging experiments that I made. I have mentioned that I had saved a few ears of barley and rice, which I had so surprisingly found spring up, as I thought, of themselves. And I believe they were about 30 stacks of rice and about 20 of barley, and now I thought it was a proper time to sow it after the rains, the sun being in its sutern position, going from me accordingly, I dug up a piece of ground, as well as I could with my wooden spade, and dividing it into two parts, I sowed my grain, but as I was sowing, it casually occurred to my thoughts that I would not sow it all at first, because I did not know when was the proper time for it. So I sowed about two-thirds of the seed, leaving about a handful of each. It was a great comfort to me afterwards that I did so, for not one grain of what I sowed this time came to anything. For the dry months following, the earth having had no rain after the seed was sown, it had no moisture to assess its growth, and never came up at all till the wet season had come again, and then it grew as if it had been but duly sown. Finding my first seed did not grow, which I easily imagined was by the drought. I sought for a moister piece of ground to make another trial in, and I dug up a piece of ground near my new bower, and sowed the rest of my seed in February, a little before the vernal exinos, and this having the rainy months of March and April to water it, sprang up very pleasantly and yielded a very good crop, but having a part of the seed left only, and not daring to sow all that I had. I had but a small quantity at last, my whole crop not amounting to above half a peak of each kind, but by this experiment I was made master of my business and knew exactly when the proper season was to sow, and that I might expect two seed times and two harvests every year. While this corn was growing, I made a little discovery, 
which was of use to me afterwards as soon as the rains were over and the weather began to settle which was about the month of november i made a visit up the country to my bower where though i had not been some months yet i found all things just as i left them the circle or double hedge that i had made was not only firm and entire but the stakes which i had cut out of some trees that grew thereabouts were all shot out and grown with long branches as much as a willow tree usually shuts the first year after lopping its head i could not tell what tree to call it that these stakes were cut from i was surprised and yet very well pleased to see the young trees grow and i pruned them and let them up to grow as much alike as i could and it is scarce credible how beautiful a figure they grew into in three years so that though the hedge made a circle of about twenty-five yards in diameter yet the trees for such i might not call them soon covered it and it was a complete shade sufficient to lodge under all the dry season this made me resolve to cut some more sticks and made me a hedge like this in a semicircle round my wall i mean that of my first dwelling which i did and placing the trees or stakes in a double row at about eight yards distance from my first fence they grew presently and were at first a fine cover to my habitation and afterwards served for a defence also as i shall observe in its order i found now that the seasons of the year might generally be divided not into summer and winter as in europe but into the rainy seasons and the dry seasons which were generally thus the half of february the whole of march and the half of april rainy the sun being then on or near the equinox the half of april the whole of may june and july in the half of august dry the sun being then to the north of the line the half of august the whole of september in the half of october rainy the sun being then come back the half of october the whole of november december and january in the half of february dry the sun being then to the south of the line the rainy seasons sometimes held longer or shorter as the winds happened to blow but this was the general observation i made after i had found by experience the ill consequences of being abroad in the rain i took care to furnish myself with provisions beforehand that i might not be obliged to go out and i sat within doors as much as possible during the wet months this time i found much employment and very suitable also to the time for i found great occasion for many things which i had no way to furnish myself with but by hard labour and constant application particularly i tried many ways to make myself a basket but all the twigs i could get for the purpose provided so brittle that they would do nothing it proved to excellent advantage to me now that when i was a boy i used to take great delight in sending at a basket makers in the town where my father lived to see them make their wicker ware and being as boys usually are very officious to help and a great observer of the manner in which they worked those things and sometimes laid in a hand i had by these means full knowledge of the methods of it and i wanted nothing but the materials but it came into my mind that the twigs of that tree from whence i cut my stakes that grew might possibly be as tough as the sallow as the sallows windows and osiers in england and i resolved to try accordingly the next day i went to my country house as i called it and cut in some of the smaller twigs i found them in my purpose as much as i could desire whereupon i came the next time prepared with the hatchet to cut down a quantity which i soon found for there was great plenty of them these i set up to try within my circle or hedge and when they were fit for use i carried them to my cave and here 
During the next season, I employed myself in making, as well as I could, a great many baskets, both to carry earth or to carry or lay up anything, as I had occasion, and thought I did not finish them very handsomely, yet I made them sufficiently serviceable for my purpose. Thus, afterwards, I took care never to be without them, and, as my wicker wear decayed, I made more, especially strong, deep baskets to place my corn in, instead of sacks, when I should come to have any quantity of it. Having mastered this difficulty and employed the world of time about it, I bestirred myself to see, if possible, how to supply two wants. I had no vessels to hold anything that was liquid except two roundlets, which were almost full of rum and some glass bottles, some of the common size, and other which were case bottles, square, for the holding of water, spirits, etc. I had not so much as a pot to boil anything, except a great kettle, which I saved out of the ship, and which was too big for such as I desired it. To make broth and stew a little of meat by myself, the second thing I feigned would have had was a tobacco pipe, but it was impossible to me to make one. However, I found a contrivance for that, too, at last. I employed myself in planting my second rows of stakes or piles, and in this wicker working all the summer or dry season, when another business took me up more time than it could be imagined I could spare.